All right. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Ben, and this is part nine in a series where we implement a DSL for UI testing in Rust. In the last video, um, we did quite a bit of work on the interpreter, um, and we start we we set up a um, system for we we basically set up an initial um, test suite. Uh, it's just got two tests in it right now, but now we have a place to add and run tests. Um, and what I'd like to do now is three things. Um, I want to get variables working, right? So we need to we need to have a concept of an environment um, where we store variables, and then I want to um, basically finish the um, finish the interpreter. Um, obviously, you know it's always going to be worked on it's always going to be updated but we want to um, go through and remove all the to-do statements in the interpreter um, and make and get it to the point where it is working and it is well documented and it is readable um, and then finally I want to start adding um, test cases I want to start building a test suite so that we can sort of cover all of the functionality of our language with tests so with that, I guess we'll get started. So the first thing we need to do is we want to set up um, a system for variables. Now in our little language, the only thing that a variable can be is a string. Um, and um, the, we only have one scope, a global scope. We don't have a concept of, um, of local scopes. So it's actually going to be very straightforward. Um, we could just stick a hash map in the top of the interpreter and use that, um, but I think what I want to do is go ahead and create an environment um, object, right, or create an, basically an environment class, um, and sort of define the interface that we want to interact with for de defining and retrieving variables. And we'll implement that probably with a hash map underneath, but then later in the future, if we want to change that, if we, you know, if our semantics change, or if we just want to do something more efficient, or you know, have have a different idea for some reason, that's what we'll do. So I'm going to make an environment RS, and this is going to be. Let's see here. We're going to pub mod environment. Great. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to have a pub struct environment. And I think I probably just want to use a tuple struct here. Do, does, we want to think, does the environment need to store any information other than a list of variables. Hmm. I'm going to go with no. I'm going to go with no for now. Well, okay, hold on. Do we want, so um, an environment might return an error, um, right? Um, so if, if we, we're going to have a sort of get method to try to retrieve a variable. Um, and if it's not there, um, we, we are going to want to turn that into an error. And the question is, do we want to turn that into an error in the interpreter with our sort of, um, self dot self dot error method I guess that's what we want to do okay so let's do a tuple struct um, and what this is going to be is it's going to be a hash map from string to string and we will bring in hash map no quick fix what if I use standard collections hash map 
How are you feeling now? Cannot find hash map in the scope. Quick fix. Oh, lowercase m. Great, okay. Sorry, I haven't had coffee this morning, so there may be a few moments like that. All right, let's implement our environment. I can type. Um, we want a new function. New, which is basically just going to have an empty hash map in there, right? Now that could change. Um, we could end up wanting to set some global variables by default and then um, let, in fact, we probably will want to do that and then let the user have the option to override them. Um, I was thinking about this earlier about how we want to let the user configure their scripts. And I don't necessarily want to have any sort of like configuration file or um, any sort of separate apparatus that requires them to set, set these scripts up in a specific way. So I think what I want to do instead is have sort of a, a list of reserved global variables. Sorry, that's my dog barking at me. One second. This is the source of the barks. This is Eloise. She's the inspiration behind Schnauzer UI. Are you going to be nice, Eloise? Are you going to be sweet? I can keep you in here if you're sweet. Okay. All right. So yeah, so um, what I think I want to do is I want to have a set of global variables that they can override. Things like a path for where to save reports to and all that. Come sit with me. You can sit with me. But for now, we're going to have an empty hash map, right? So basically what we want to do is construct self around a new hash map. There we go. We've got a new function. All right. We need a couple functions. We need a function for setting a variable. And for us, there's not really going to be any sort of um, semantic difference between um, declaring and instantiating a variable because there, there's no semantic difference in our in our code about that. You just you you say set something as this. There's no there's no simple set command. So you can't declare a variable without instantiating it. So we're going to say we're going to take a mute self. Yeah, that's perfect. Um actually we might can do better than that. So the way this is going to work is that um in the interpreter, we're going to be performing this on a set variable command or a, I'm sorry, it's not a command, a set variable um, statement or in the commands, this read to command. In both of those, if I look at the parser, actually store a string. So a set variable statement has the variable name and value as a string already. And if we look at command read to as a command param, which is going to have a string in it. Okay, so there's no need to sort of take a reference when we already we already own the string. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this is going to self dot zero dot um, insert and we're going to give it um, the key and value so that's going to be the variable name and that's going to be the value and insert returns an option v so if something um, if something was already defined there before, it will return it, but if the key was not present, then it won't. 
um, we actually don't care, right? Um, so we're just going to do that. Great. And then we're going to have a pub function get variable. Um, <coughs> and I think I think for now we'll turn um, I think for now um, we will rather than calling these through the environment um, we'll have methods you know sort of um, similar methods in the interpreter that call them um, because we might want to have we might want to have variables that are set based on the runtime environment but the point is that um, get variable is going to return an option string but at some point and we have to decide what that point is we'll want to convert that option string into um, the interpreter's runtime error type. But for now, we'll do self dot zero dot get. Um, and we'll give it the variable name. Right, and that's going to return an option referenced to a string. So let's go ahead and clone that string for the person. Um, actually, s. We'll say s dot clone. Too owned by work. We say s dot clone. Yeah. Okay. That's going to work for now. And if we want to change it later, then we can. And then in the interpreter, the interpreter is going to have. Put it up here because it's pretty darn important. It's going to have an environment. And when we create the interpreter, we will give it an a new environment. Great. <coughs> now what we may want to do, like I said, we may instantiate some global variables. Um, we could do that in the constructor, but it would also make sense to do that in the constructor of environment. It would also make sense to do that in the constructor of the interpreter. Um, and then sort of define them against the environment before passing it in. Okay, but now we have a place where we can store and retrieve strings as variables. So let's use that. So the first thing we need to implement is a set variable command. So let's do that. And let's just do this in a separate method. Self dot set variable. And we'll call it with SV. And that probably won't be async. Pub functions set variable. Right? And that's going to take a set variable statement. Let's do it like this. Let's destructure it in the argument or in the parameter spot. So what fields do you have? You have a variable name and a value. It's easy enough. Variable name and a value. And you don't fail. Right? Great. And then all we have to do is we can say self dot environment dot set variable like that. Um, and you just need to take a mutable reference to self. Eloise, do you want to go back out now? You just got to make a decision where you want to be.
Maybe should have paused for that. Oh well. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So we should be able to set a variable. Um, the only thing is this doesn't return a result because it's not fallible. So let's do this. Let's do that. And then we'll just return OK. Great. Now we want to do the other place that we can um, set a variable, which is a read to command. What's up with you? Other oh, private. Um, in parser. This idea of a set variable, you need to be pub. And you need to be pub. Great. Okay, so we can set variables. Now what we want to do is we want to have the ability to um, read the contents of some web element that we've located to, um, to a variable. So in command, in execute command, we have this read to statement, right? This is a read to statement. And let's call self dot read to. Now the this is the command parameter. Okay, so let's call this what it is. It takes a command parameter, and let's say. Will this be? Let's make our method. Pub function read to takes a mute self and a command parameter. And it can return a runtime result. And we'll say that. Right, because the idea is we're going to be doing a um, oh, runtime result string. Um, eventually, we will um, create a runtime error, and then that alias will become even simpler, and it will just say runtime result and the return value. We could do that with string right now, um, but I've sort of left it like this to remind me, hey, you're using stringly typed errors. You need to fix this soon. Okay, so a command parameter, let's go to it, is either a string or a variable, right? So now this is interesting. So a read to command. Supposedly, right? The the way you would use this is you would have something like um, right here where it says locate, submit, and click. You would say something like read. Submit to um, button text, right? The idea being that um, this one's sort of silly because it's saying, hey, find the button with the text submit and read the text of that button to this variable. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so what we're saying is um, read takes a locator, basically. No, it doesn't. It doesn't doesn't work like that. It works like locate submit 
and read to button text. There we go. So um, we have a currently located element, and what we do is we read the text of that element to some variable name. Now, this seems sort of silly when we're locating the element by its text, but you can imagine if we're locating an element by its X path, right? The idea here is that we might not know the text, we, we might not know the text that's going to show up in the element, but we have some other way of locating it. Um, so what we want to do is we want to locate that element and then read the read the text of it to a variable. So, so when command param so this is the command parameter and it can either take a variable or a string so why supposedly a read to command should just take a string for the variable name shouldn't it right there right you wouldn't say um, See if we look at the parser. And so command parameter has a string. Right, the idea is some of these some of these commands take an input, and that can either be a string or it can be the name of a variable that we need to resolve to a string. But the read to command should really just take. Um, a string. So let's change that. Read to should really just take a string for the variable name. So down here, when we're parsing a read to command we advance on we advance on the token type variable and then we say okay or self dot error variable and then we match on the variable we've parsed and we say if it's got the okay here we go so we already handled this so in parsing we said that the read to command was just going to take a variable um, and we said if it's some token with the token type variable v then we return then we set it um, but if it's not a variable then we do this we do this error um, I think what I want to do is rather than wrap this command, wrap this in a command parameter, we'll just give it the string because, right, there's really no, there's really no sense that it would ever be, that it would ever be valid to pass a, um, to pass just a string literal. Right, the idea being, um, right, you can define a new, you can, you know, define a new variable with this command, but you shouldn't wrap the name of that variable in quotes, because then you're implying that you're passing a string. Okay. So now, expected command parameter, right, take a string. And then what we'll do is we'll just say let text equals self dot um, get current element, right? And then we want to propagate that error if there's no element in focus. And then we want to say text dot await um, and then we want to map the error if we get some sort of web driver error on this then we just want to return um, 
one of our errors saying um, that error getting text from element and we'll add more like um, we'll add more context to these errors when we extract them into custom errors right they'll all get they'll all get like a the token that they're on and whatnot for context um, yeah map error and then propagate it if we need to great and then text should be a string look at that then we'll just say self dot environment dot what do we call it set variable and the name is going to be the this guy that's going to be the variable name so we'll do name and then the text and then once that's done we'll just give back an OK so you do need to be async and then you need to be dot awaited and have your error propagated great okay so presumably we should be able to set variables um, and also read the text of variables now let's confirm that with tests right so we have uh, we have this test set up um, I'm going to rename this health check and basically this is going to be a test that right um, bad test errors and good test does not error those are essentially um, checking that error handling works driver closes at after execution this is basically the health check I want to say that we can open up the browser run a script and have it you know all, all we're gonna do is navigate to this URL um, and then once we've done that um, it will close the browser and we'll get an okay because there was no error in the script execution so we've got everything running looks like so I'm going to rename this health check. Great. And then I'm going to make a new file called catcherror.rs. And then I'm going to move these tests into catch error. Um, that's certainly not the only testing we're going to do for the catch error statement, but it's just where it goes right now. Um, and then we'll say you also need this guy and then that's funny um, and then now we need a new test for um, variables variables.rs and we'll have you schnauzer and let's do a Tokyo tests um, async function I'm just going to see if those are pub okay um, <coughs> async function um, manually set set locator for element right um, so we'll do a test where we sort of manually set, we use the save as command to save a locator and then we use that to um, locate an element and presumably because we were able to locate that element it should pass um, and then 
We'll do Tokyo. Async function. Um, read locator from um, element. So the idea here is that um, we'll have we'll have a test page where we have the locator specified to the left of the element we're actually trying to locate um, as its own web element and we'll read the text of the locator from that and then we'll use it to locate the element that we're looking for um, and both of the reason both of these are going to be looking for something like actually looking for something instead of just checking that um, checking that we've got the string we want is we don't really have a setup um, for checking strings, right? We could we could also do it by bringing in the interpreter and sort of verifying that the variable is in um, is in the environment, but I, I don't think that's what I want to do. At least for now. Okay. Um, we need test HTML. Let's turn off our Python server for a minute and let's add the HTML for these tests. So let's call this, you know what, this is variables rs, let's call this variables.html. And we'll do variables. And we need, let's have paragraph test uh, test text or really we'll call it um, I show you where to type and then we'll have form right uh, with input element um, and that input element will have we'll go with placeholder we'll have a placeholder with this text so the idea is um, Ooh. So our locate command might locate placeholder. We'll locate placeholder first and try to get the text of that element. Hmm. Okay, so you can see how we're we're running into problems already with our locator precedence. So before um we tried to we wanted it to locate an element um, so before we were trying to get it to type into this form right um, and we wanted to be able to type um, locate username and type as um, input type email do you not have a placeholder Right, so we, we wanted to be able to type locate username and type as username. Um, and the thing was, it located the label username, right? But what we wanted it to do was locate the adjacent input field. Um, so we made a priority for um, form fields. We said, you know, it find a, find a placeholder, um, find an adjacent input field or an input field with that placeholder first and then default to element text, right? Because if if you have an input field with some placeholder, you, you probably want to type into that or with some, you know, adjacent label, that's probably what you want to type in. You're not trying to interact with the label. You're trying to um, type into the 
input field. So here, we're running into a problem where I want it to read the text of this variable um, and use it as the locator for finding this element. I tell you what, I'll just give this an ID. ID equals locate me. Right? Um, and we don't have location, we don't have locating by IDs set up yet, so we need to we need to add that, right? The only three locators we've added are placeholders. Um, finding a form field by its adjacent um, label and just the element text. So let's do ID. Let's do an interpreter. Let's go to the locate command, just way down here. I'm sorry, that's my dog. She's making it tough to do the video today. Okay, so here we're sort of we locate by its placeholder, we locate an input element by a preceding label, and then we try to find an element by its text. I think the next thing we want to do is try to find an element by its ID. Try to find an element by its ID. Right. This is the sort of after we do the visual elements, then we want to start looking at the typical like ways you would locate HTML. Um, and so we probably want to go to ID first. So we're going to say if let's okay found elements equals self dot driver dot query. And we're going to query by ID, and then we're going to give it um, label locator. This takes a locator command parameter. Great. Um, and then we resolve it into this variable locator. Locator. Then uh, we want to do a no wait query on that, um, and we only want this. We definitely only want a single element with this ID, um, and then we just await that. And if that's an okay element, we say. We set it as the current element, and then we return the result of that. Um, you're angry because you need to be borrowed. Great. OK. Um, now, if we're going to use that, um, resolve element has to work. And right now, resolve element will work for a string but it won't work for a variable. I guess we, we can locate elements right now because I can pass it the ID. Okay, we'll get to this soon, I promise. Okay, let's go to variables. Wait, what was I doing? Oh, the HTML. Um, okay, so the idea is I can tell it to locate this element by its ID, by the ID locate me and then read the text and then I'll verify that I read the text correctly by using it to locate this input element and type into it. So let's write a script for that. So let's have variables. So this is going to be um, reading the locator from the element. So let's do let script equal Right, um, and the idea is we will say um, URL and then 
what was the yeah it's this but then the path is going to be variables right so slash variables dot html so we visit that URL and then we want to um, we want to locate um, by the ID locate me um, and read to um, let's call the variable my placeholder right so we're locating the element with the ID locate me and then we read its text to a variable called my placeholder and then what I want to do is locate my placeholder and type found you right um, and then we'll execute this test, which we do like this. Right, we want to run the test and we just want to assert that the result is okay. We're still doing this sort of bool for the early return. So let's assert that the result is okay and then let's assert that um, Result uh, unwrap is false because we don't. The idea is if it early returns, then this is not working. Um, we want it to execute the entire script. Okay. Now we may run into an issue here, which is that we don't have a. Hopefully, we won't run into the issue yet, but I'm realizing. We don't really have, I don't really know what we do if we run into an error and we don't find a catch error block. Um, presumably, we just run out the script because the catch error block with a try again is the only place that we're ever going to, uh, or the catch error block is the only place that we're ever going to reset had error. So if we don't have any sort of catch error block, then it just should fail. We'll write a test for that too. Let's reserve this environment. And then I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this one test so we can watch it happen. There's a obviously a command line command for that, but when, when VS Code gives you the button, just click it. All right, so here we go. It is compiling. Running one test. What's Eloise doing in the background? Hi. Eloise, what are you doing in the background? What are you eating? A chew toy? That's okay. All right. Hey, look, we typed into it. So we, or no, not yet. But we have, <coughs> we have this paragraph. I show where to type, and then we have this placeholder. Um, and hopefully, we'll type into that. Ooh, what happened? Thread read located from element panic that not yet implemented. Hmm. Interpreter 231. An interpreter 231. Ah! it had to resolve a variable because we resolve so let's look at our script right it had to resolve this variable in order to type in found you okay um, so let's implement resolve variable it's interesting that that um, 
browser didn't close, but it's it's because we panicked, um, right? The test the test panicked. Um, let's see here in interpreter. We need to implement resolve. So okay, so if we've got some variable text v, then really we just want to self dot environment dot get. We want to get the variable, um, and we want to get the variable v, right? Um, but then that returns an option, right? Yeah. And so what we have to do is we have to say OK or, and then we give it the self dot error variable is not yet defined. Great. What's your problem? You don't have to be mutable. You don't have to be mutable, sir. Quit your nonsense. Okay. Let's try that again. Let's go to our tests. And run it. You think it's going to pass, Eloise? Eloise is angry because I didn't take her on her morning walk. But what she doesn't know is in about an hour, um, she is going to be playing with a dog a hundred times her size. And it's going to totally wear her out. That's right, you're gonna go see Duncan. So that passed, by the way. Um, I don't know if you noticed, um, obviously our test passed, um, so we executed the entire script without erroring. But I don't know if you noticed in the browser, it was able to type found ya into the element. So that test is passing. Woo! Let's do manually setting the variable for the locator. This is basically going to be the same script, but instead of locating an element and reading its value to a variable, we're just going to set the value. So I'm going to say save my placeholder. I oh know it's going to be um, save. Uh, the placeholder I'm looking for. I think it's, yeah, I show you where to type. Right, if we go to variables, I want to save that string as a variable called my placeholder. Right, and then the rest should be the same. Then we should be able to locate it and run. So let's run that test. Error, at, I show you where to type, expected a variable name. Does it take the variable, oh it takes the variable name first. Maybe we need to clear up that syntax. It is kind of confusing, isn't it? It's not clear what goes where. Maybe we'll call it set. Right? If we call it set, then it's pretty clear that the variable name comes first. Is it? Set. Uh, let's try that, right? So. We want, sorry. We want a variable called my placeholder with the text I show where to type. Maybe we could say as text. Hmm. No. Sacrifice one flip flop for a moment of peace. All right, we're running the test. Here's our browser. And we typed found you into the browser. 
Great. Okay, so variables are working. Um, let's talk about this. Save my placeholder as I show you where to type. call it variable, we could say, you know, var my placeholder, I mean, we, we could say var my placeholder equals, right? That's why it's in this order, because it's mimicking that. Um, Yeah, we'll, we'll go with this for now, and we'll we may decide to change this later. It's just a matter of remembering what goes first. Um, remember, we had the idea before of maybe just having syntax like this, right? And that simple statement, my place, right? Because this is not a command, it would know that you're trying to set a variable. Um, I don't know though. We'll see, but okay. So we've got variables working, that's awesome. Um, the other two tasks were to clean up the interpreter um, and to start beefing up our test cases. And I think, yeah, let's go ahead and try to remove all to-dos from the interpreter and then I think that's actually all I wanna do for this video. So let's do, we're looking for the word to do. We've got one more to do, an if statement. Okay, let's do it. Self dot. Execute. If statement, and it's going to take an if statement and we'll call dot await on it, right? And you're gonna contain the if statement. All right. Set variable, put it here. Function, execute, if statement. Um, this is going to be If statement and you're going to return a runtime results with a string as the error and then yeah great okay so now what we want to do is we want to cannot find type if statement. Bring it in. Give me the give me the quick fix. Yeah. Great. So now what we want to do is we'll go to the implementation. Right? It has a condition, which is a command, and a then branch, which is a command statement. So let's do. First, we have to execute the command. So let's do let results, or let condition result equals self dot um, execute command. And that's going to be the statement dot condition, right? Um, 
private. Always do that. Your pub. Your pub. You are data. Let me see you. Okay. So, right, so execute command statement is going to return a result. But we, with an if statement, um, if that command errors, that's actually fine. Like in our, in our context, um, evaluating to an error is the same thing as evaluating to false, right? So we want to say like, if locate something, then do something else, right? And if that locate command errors, um, we don't want to quit the program. We don't want to go into like, we don't want to go into hat error mode. Um, because it's wrapped up in an if statement. We want to say, if the, if we can locate that, um, do something. If not, just keep moving. So what we're going to do is we're going to downgrade this error. Um, and we're going to say dot is okay. right? And that's basically going to downgrade it to a Boolean. right? Um, dot execute. But we need to dot await this. Great. Now what we want to do is if if that happened, and I guess we'll inline this. Right. If the condition goes off without a hitch. Then we want to self dot execute the command statement. Statement dot. It's got a condition. It's got a then branch. Um, and then we will return the result of that um, of that command execution. Otherwise. We just want to say OK. All right? Yeah. There we go. Um, so let's do. If that works. I think what I want to do is I'm going to destructure this in the command argument of statements as a condition. And a then branch. Then we don't have to do that. Great. Um, now what we want to do is write a test for it. That dog. Let's write a test for it. So in you have variables, let's make some HTML called if statement, right? And the idea is that these um, HTML files are going to end up, uh, the names of these HTML files are going to align with our test modules, and each module will sort of have its own HTML file to test against. Um, Bad test error. We want to do if statement dot rs. And let's do you schnauzer run. And then we'll do a Tokyo test pub async function test. Um, but what do we want to call this test? Um, we'll, we'll just call this if statement for now. And then as we add more tests regarding if statements, we'll, um, we'll refactor it. So the first thing we want to do, let's see here, this is if statement. I think what we want to do is we want to have um, the if statement try to locate something that does not exist on the page and fail to do so. 
um, and make sure that that doesn't cause an early error. And then I want it to successfully locate something on the page and then type into it so that we can verify that it's executing the following command. So we can do something like, um, we can just have a form and then we'll have um, a label that says um, type here and then we'll have um, a text input with no name or ID, right? The idea is that we just want to we want to locate this text input based on the fact that there's a label right before it. Um, and so if we look at this, we'll try um, we'll try to type into an element that doesn't exist and then we'll try to type into this. So let's go to if statement tests say try typing into an element that doesn't exist. So actually we want to write that comment in the script. So let's have a script. Let's go to right. Um, but we want to go to if statement.html and then let's try typing into a non existent element. So we'll say if locate I don't exist then type Yeah, and that converts to, I shouldn't have to put and. I should be able to just say then type um, I shouldn't be typing this. And then we'll do now type into an existing element. We'll say if locate, what did we call that um, label type here? If we locate an element that says type here, then type, we'll say woohoo. Right? Um, so the idea is we're testing that if, if, when this locator fails, it should not throw an error and it should not try to execute this, which would throw an error um, because we don't have a currently located element at that point. And then when we execute this statement, this locate should succeed. And then because it succeeded, um, we should follow up by executing this type command. So then let's run the script. And we want to. We want to assert um, that the script run went OK, right? The web driver opened and closed correctly and all that. And then we want to assert that there was no early return, right? So we return false, meaning there was no early return. So let's run this test. You know what? Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that, whatever I just did. I think um, I think we might be in some trouble.
because oh no there it is great I was worried that um, I needed to restart the, the hosting um, but okay so it's currently timing out right trying to find locate I don't exist um, yeah so it looks like it passed right it timed out trying to locate I don't exist so it didn't execute this and then it located this almost immediately and then typed woohoo um, I wish I had been watching it type woohoo but sometimes you just gotta trust your tests you know all right let's see we are at an hour and five yeah I think I'm gonna stop this video here and then next time um, we will probably do a lot of refactoring and a lot of test authoring. But for now, let's be excited. The entire interpreter is implemented. See you next time.